today is the day, and what you just saw is a rendering of the Arate GT supercar. And in a moment, we're going to take a look at about the last 18 months of work on that project. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Jay Jarvie, and I'm a prototype engineer. When I say that, most people look at me with blank stares. But if I just say I make things, they logically just want to know, well, what kind of things? So I thought, why not just take this all to social media and show you? So what you're about to see are the efforts of my first year on YouTube. Now this video is a condensed version of probably seven hours of video on YouTube, or 1,500 hours of labor on the project, and probably an extra couple hundred hours beyond that in just designing, planning, and thinking about the project. So without any further ado, let's just go take a look at it. Although the design of this car is all in my head, I did need to go into a CAD system and get out some dimensions so that I could make an enlargement into the plug of the model we're going to take molds off of. So I started off with a smaller scale model and kind of created the form that I wanted. I could also uh, add some features and try them in the clay, but the final design in the large version was going to be where all the work and the design was going to take place for the finish. I did take a cheap throw off or throw away mold from that small model so that I could be able to cut that up. And so created a, just a cheap silicone mold and poured me a new version in plaster. And once that plaster model was set up and the mold stripped from it, what I'm going to do is take that plaster mold and slice it in scale. So the ribs going to be placed one foot apart. So at 16 feet, I made 16 slices out of that plaster model. Then take those slices and transfer them onto a piece of paper. And in my case, what I did is I actually just scanned those pieces of paper and then took them into my CAD system and enlarged them and printed them out. Take those prints, transfer those to plywood. There are a few ribs that are heavier plywood to add some rigidity and some location points. But most of the ribs were created out of just a eighth inch plywood. And then once all those ribs are cut out, I'm going to assemble them onto a framework and just a, a wood framework would have worked, but I'd happen to have this rotisserie. And so the steel bars allowed me to just drill some holes, some three inch holes, slide the ribs onto those bars, and then able to slide those out every foot like in this case, it welded a little metal tab that I was able to attach the ribs to. Then there was some diagonal bracing that went in to straighten everything up. But at this point, it's a little bit flimsy and floppy. So the system is, in this template method, is to coat the entire thing with burlap soaked in plaster of Paris. So notice there's also some strings running between each of the ribs. This allows or keeps the burlap from sagging too much. A little bit of sag is good because we're going to go back and fill all those low spots in with actual drywall plaster after this plaster of Paris is set up. With the drywall plaster, it sets up with air. You don't have to mix it and it's very easy to sand. So this is the method of creating the model is to uh, build it up with plaster sand and like working in clay which is about 10 times more expensive the plaster allows you to add and subtract at will also with the plaster in this case i'm using a windshield off existing vehicle i'm able to just kind of grout or inject plaster around the windshield to get the form of that and then it's a matter of just going through adding like i said adding and subtracting plaster just like you would in the clay you do have to take some time to wait for the plaster to dry. And that's of course is all dependent upon how thick you put it on. And these first few layers put it on quite heavy. But this gave me some time to uh, work on the front, let it dry for a few days, and then go work on the backside. When you do it thick, it does crack, but you're just going to keep building up layers. So the idea is just sand off all the high spots, then add plaster again until you've got it smoothed out to the finished form you want. Like I said, this is probably about 10 times, if more, not more, I should say more, but less expensive than working in a clay. It also 
creates a surface finish that you can really easily work on rather than worrying about denting a clay mock-up. So here it is getting close to finish work. So then now once you've got the basic form done, it's time to start checking things and make sure everything's symmetrical. And to do that, I used a laser system. This rotisserie had a little kind of a track on top and I'm able to set up my lasers. So I've got these little red dots that show me center of the vehicle, set up a laser to get my square perpendicular measurements correct. And then I also use this scale or this pointer that, that measures off the floor height. So I can put it on one side of the car, measure the height on one side, take it around the opposite side and check it on that side. And once everything is set where I want it, I've got the basic plug ready to go. I'm going to seal the plaster with the urethane just because I'm going to put a thin fiberglass layer on to strengthen it up, make it a little hard surface. Don't want that fiberglass, the resin to soak in. So then it's just a matter of once that urethane's hard, go ahead, a little resin and fiberglass, put a nice thin coat on, hardens the surface up. Now at this point, I finished a new shop and had to move it to the opposite side of the house. Got some friends over and we're just gonna move it to its new home. So now what we have is the basic shape, but the surface finish is not nearly as close as what we need to take molds off of it. We need, of course, an automotive finish. So we have to start just applying layer after layer to build up and work down to a perfect surface. So the first layer is just resin with microspheres added to it, or like Bondo, the same system. And then of course, sanding, go back, touching up minor, small or low spots, and then some sanding. And once we got this surface finished, it's time to move on and start adding another layer, a little harder. Now this is resin mixed with some calcium carbonate and mixed a little bit thinner so that it actually kind of flows out and settles into the low spots. Also, it makes it a lot harder surface to sand. But we're able to get a little harder surface and be able to see our low spots as well. And then once we get down to getting very close, it's just a matter of going back and finding any little imperfections using basic body techniques. Fill a couple, I had a little blister here, just need to fill that in. And then we've got it down to where the basic shape is almost perfect. All we have to do now is just start working down finer and finer layers of sandpaper to get the finish we want. Once we're there, we've got one more layer to get close to perfection and that is putting a layer of primer on. Take it in the paint booth, put some primer on, and then of course, back to sanding. But we're getting close and uh, getting to the finish we need. But like I said, always more sanding. And more sanding. And once you've got it where you need to, it's time to put on a finish. Now I just went out and bought um, some cheap automotive paint, which is actually just the paint supply place had something that was either not picked up or returned, had something wrong with it. And of course, I'm gonna finish the car in blue, but I thought I would just get a nice red put on it just for the sake of seeing it would look like in red. And of course, once you've got an automotive finish on, you've got a good glossy finish to work off of, but even that's not enough. Going back to that automotive paint, now I can start buffing it, waxing it, getting ready to take molds off of. But we're going to take a break from the body itself and go on to see some of the other work that was going on at the same time, some of the mechanical side. So one of the things I have to do is I'm using a Toyota 1JZ engine and adapting it to a Chevy 4L65E transmission. So I have to make a bell adapter to adapt the transmission to the 1JZ bolt pattern. So created a pattern in the CAD, printed out to test it, see if everything fits and lines up. Once we have that pattern made, 
and I know it's going to fit in the paper. Time to send it to the water jet cutter and get these plates cut. So here's the parts we're going to use to make that bell adapter. I got this big piece of aluminum tube that's just not quite the exact diameter. Couldn't find something exactly, so I'm going to cut it, take it in the milling machine, make sure everything is perpendicular on the edges or parallel on the edges, I should say, so that we can get everything as accurate as possible. Now you can see my little spacer keeping that thing to the right diameter. Putting on the adapter plates. Now I also uh, added a couple of extra holes in my CAD drawings to uh, put the thing together. Tube through the middle to line everything up as perfectly as we can. And then it's into the welding to start tying all the pieces together. Now once these pieces are welded together, we can cut out the middle section, which is all just there to hold everything in alignment. Finish weld some of the inside seams. And there it is on the engine. I'm also converting from a single CT15B turbocharger that came with the JZ engine. I'm going to be using dual turbocharger setup um, for two reasons. One reason, of course, is it's less expensive to get these used turbochargers, which people are getting rid of when they go to a larger turbocharger. But I can use the volumetric efficiency of the smaller turbochargers to keep them spinning up quicker for less turbo lag. But I had a complete rebuild on both of these turbochargers. This is just stepping through that process. The hot side, I used the Cerakote ceramic coatings, kind of a titanium color to brighten things up and make everything a little nicer and cleaner. I'm also clocking these turbochargers slightly different. So there's a little pin that makes the alignment for the clocking of the turbocharger. And so redrilled those. Now the cool side, powder coated in this blue along with the other parts of the engine are going to be in this blue to match our exterior in the end. Exhaust system was a matter of putting the turbochargers in place and uh, lining up tubing. Now the waste gates in these uh, turbochargers built in, it's going to dump into the main exhaust housing. So once these manifolds were built, I found that the original idea I was going to use for a muffler was not going to work. So I ended up having to build my own muffler. So getting ready here with the sheet metals to build that muffler. It's going to be a square box with the muffle tubes mounted inside. This little bend die I created to go into the hydraulic press makes a nice radius bends. Once they're all done, tack the thing together. Now this thing's built out of um, pre-bent, prefabricated tubes. Got the end plates for this box so that these little 180 degree bends will fit right through there. One nice tight fit, kind of slightly under, kind of a size. And I'm actually notching and uh, bending these tubes. Exhaust pipes are going to be inside the muffler. And then I'm going to pack them with stainless steel and fiberglass. Welding the system together. You can see all my perforations there. Now I'm covering them with this uh, stainless steel, stainless steel wire, tie everything in place. The stainless steel has 
very large openings to allow some of the exhaust gases to escape quickly. And then wrapping it with stainless steel, tying the fiberglass on. Once these things are wrapped, all that sound deadening material is tied on good. We're going to insert it into the box itself, the resonator chamber. Now, it seems like such a simple thing to uh, go out and buy a muffler for anything you're building because there's like 10,000 different variations of mufflers. But when you start talking mid-engine configurations and putting the muffler behind all that, your options become a lot less. So there's nothing left for me to do but go ahead and build my own. Problem is, is uh, in the end, we will see what kind of uh, sound we get and flow. I think the flow will be just great. Sound is just going to be what we get. No ability to do any kind of uh, tuning here. Once that baffling is all wrapped good, like I said, inserted into the box, now it's just a matter of going to welding the whole thing closed. Trial fit, tack everything in place, bring it back to the bench and uh, put all the final welds on there. Again, Cerakote ceramic coating. And then it's back onto the subframe. Hold this thing in place. I also made this um, fully able to be disassembled with multiple joints so that you didn't have to remove most of the car to get to this thing if we had to pull out and do any maintenance on it. It will be easy to pull out once it's in the car. Now you've seen me assembling that muffler onto the subframe, but we're going to jump back a little bit now and uh, see some of that subframe. I'll cut out of chromoly steel tubing, not using any bends on this, but using all straight tubing. This makes it very easy to do all your geometry. Tack weld it with the MIG, bring it in and start doing all the final welds with the TIG welder. And once I had that subframe built, at least it's the basics of the subframe. We've got lots of things to come with adding to it, all the pickup points, mounting points for all kinds of components. But once that subframe's basic form was created, brought the engine into the shop, used the lift to uh, hold it up because I had to get some pretty precise, accurate alignments. Kind of, kind of jumping backwards, aren't we here? This is the, the block. I've done some engine rebuild also, part of the fun thing about this thing is be able to try new things. And I'm new into this electronics world, but building our own ECU and uh, transmission controllers. Comes from a, a kit, creating our own wiring setup. So to match these ECUs. Wiring diagram creates a cut list and then go out to a matter of measuring the length of each wire. According to the cut list, once those measurements are created, we can go to the bench and start cutting wires and laying out our wiring harness. Kind of a long, tedious process, but kind of rewarding and uh, nice to just sit at the bench and Work on this thing, do your best to try to make it night, nice and neat. I 
I went with a system of using all of the same colored wires. Of course, color, a couple of wires are different color because they came with some of the sensors, but I just used a single color wiring system and then just put printed labels at the end of each wire. So it's easy to trace what that wire is from the sensor back to the control board. Now the control board has these um, connectors that are going to allow me to have the ECU and the transmission controller in the cabin of the car connected through military bulkhead connectors. All the electronics mounted to this plate, which will attach to the firewall. Give me one central unit for all of the fuses, relays, grounds. So here it is connected to that panel, just kind of a trial fit to see where those wiring are going to go. Now, when you're building a car from scratch, it's always a matter of uh, components from other vehicles. If you want to save some expense in the system, our wheels, brakes are all created from different things. These brakes from a Porsche. Of course, we don't want it to say Porsche. We want it to have our name on it and powder coated to this nice, beautiful orange. Our color scheme is going to be cobalt blue and orange. Here's the powder coating for as you saw before on the turbos, valve covers, intake. Now we're on to some of the suspension components. This being the front upper control arm. All the control arms are built out of a water jet cut plate and steel tubing. These water jet cut parts make for alignment very nice. Precision on water jet cutting is uh, pretty high when it comes to components such as this. And then using off the shelf urethane bushings. Now we're moving on to our rear upper control arm. This control arm is also the rocker for the inboard mounted shock absorbers. And as we go, of course, all the components sandblasted, powder coated. And again, back to the same off the shelf urethane bushings. Ball joints pressed into place. Some control arms completed. Now with some mechanical stuff, we're on to building the body here, the rear active wing, the first mold, probably the simplest. Now I have a extruder I've built to uh, make these little walls that will create our parting lines in the finished molds. Press those clay walls into place and then go and finish the edges. So I have a nice sharp edge on the mold line. Another parting line being built is of course the rear hatch engine cover. Using this clay as our parting line walls makes it convenient that they can be pressed and molded into position. Typically in the past, I have used metal flashings, cut a notch, put the flashing in. I did use that in a couple of places on the car, but with these compound curves, the clay was much easier to make our form out of. And once all the parting lines are created with those walls, I had to put a little releasing agent on there. Our gel coat. And then start laying up our molds. Now we're working on the doors. Just wasn't convenient to go back to the spray gun 
Takes a little more work, a couple more coats to brush a gel coat on. Then each of my molds are started with uh, just fiberglass cloth, and then building up to mat and reinforcements around all those flange lines. Once all the molds are done, trim off all the ragged edges, and you can start pulling the molds from the plug. There's our first mold off. Now a little bit more uh, adhesion on a big part like this. So uh, working all the edges, just go round and round till you get that separation. There you go, another mold off of the plug. Now in all in all, there's 11 pieces on this plug, 11 molds off of it. Some of them small, and there they all are in completed pieces, ready to start making parts. Now, of course, always starting with the smallest one to get the technique down. This is that front lower quarter panels. Now the turn back that those parting line, those clay walls made for our parting line, put flashing onto that to turn that back on the mold so that we can create a flange that goes to the interior of the part. We just start laying up our fiberglass against the part and up against those metal flashings. And just keep building up layers until we get the strength and stiffness that we want. I'm using a Nomex honeycomb as cores to uh, stiffen and strengthen the panels. Once they're cured, some soft wedges and uh, start parting the pieces. And there we go, our first part out of the mold. Now the biggest and largest, most complex part is the tub, the monocoque tub. So we assemble some of the mold sections. Here the doors are reattached that main center section and then the flashing rather than being a clip to the outside edge or some of them will be on the outside edge but these connected pieces the flashings inserted between them and then when I build the parts up against that flashing which is uh, like 26 gauge metal that will create our gap now this is a uh, working on the windshield area or the windows and that flashing has to create a little bit of a turn back that's going to hold our uh, gutters for those windows. Bottom edge of that door, flashing clipped on. Another piece of the mold, the engine cover, bolting it in place. Same thing, you know, bolt it in place and then insert some flashing so that our parting line is uh, perfect. And before those bolts are actually bolted tight, like I said, those flashings are inserted between the two pieces. Once flashings are in, tighten up all the bolts. And it's on with uh, starting to do the lamination for the parts themselves. Here we are doing the, the roof between the two doors. And once we have our First layers all on, again, back to Nomex Honeycomb for reinforcing the center section. The dashboard is built into the monocoque tub. Working the bottom side of the dash here. Squeegeeing out all the excess resin, reinforcing against the flashing or turn backs with some fiberglass tapes. Now all this lamination is just a matter of getting the basic form of this tub because we are going to go back and do lots and lots of reinforcing as this is the main structure of the whole car is through this monocoque tub. But we are doing these layups to uh, 
get the basic form. Building up to hold it. This is a solid form. But of course, this is just uh, the basic exterior shape. So we're going to have to go in and uh, create bulkheads and footwells under the dash. All those pieces that aren't part of the original plug that we took molds off of. You have to create those from foam sheets. And of course, the main one's going to be that rear firewall bulkhead behind the driver and passenger seats. Use some templates to uh, create the form that brought over, do it out on these foam sheets, cut them out. Once that was uh, bonded in place, same kind of foam sheets used to create the floorboards. And each of these foams glued together with uh, just expanding foam and then trimmed. And then it's a matter of going back and uh, starting to fiberglass over them to create the strength. Also, there's places where there's uh, bolts or fastening points that we don't want any foam between those. So we're going to cut the foam out so that we have fiberglass from one side, fiberglass from the other side of the foam meets together and creates uh, an area where there's only fiberglass so that we won't have any compression of the foam between them. And once we have enough fiberglass onto all these foam components, creating our bulkheads front and back and the floor, and one of the wheel wells create a little bit there, we have enough rigidity in the part to actually take it out of the mold. So you've seen the engine covers gone, just pulled the doors off. Now just trying to free the part up from the mold. And there is the center section monocoque tub. So it's also a matter of now start building all the other parts. Once that door is out, got up on the bench, put some more layers in it. Now we have a door skin. Front subframe. Like I said, these subframes were previously put together, just the basics, and now it's time to start adding components to it. A couple of pickup points. Fastening places for our front differential. This is where the steering rack is going to go. Subframe attached again. Now we know that we need to also run the stainless steel pipe through the monocoque tub. That's going to be our coolant lines coming and going. And then let's retry our subframe back into the, the start of our monocoque tub. Well, there you go, a condensed version of the Airtay Supercar project up to this point. I hope you enjoyed that video, and if you did, you're probably a petrol head like many of those who stopped by here. And if you are, I hope you subscribe to the channel. So please go ahead and go down, subscribe, ring the little bell icon so that we can notify you when the other videos for the completion of this project and other things come up. But anyway, thanks for stopping by. I hope we see you again.